told this tale before, but it's the perfect example of being on God's timetable. It's about uh, the week in which my husband died in 2004. He went into hospice on December the 16th. He had just turned 63, and he was there only four days. When I called my sister in Pennsylvania, she drove nonstop to the hospice where he was. She didn't even stop to change her clothes. And when she saw how tired I was and how tired my son was, she very firmly sent us home to rest. And during that period, Bob chose to leave the body. Now, my sister was a disciple of Alma, the hugging saint. And as she told the story, that last day, that fourth day, she sat by his bed chanting, chanting him home. Some of you may know that Alma always gives Hershey kisses as prasad after she has embraced people who come to see her, get her hugs. And on this day, December the 20th, 2004, he had fallen unconscious at, at last. But they brought his evening meal, and on the tray she looked down and she said there was the Hershey kiss. And so she unwrapped it, and she sliced it, a sliced a tiny bit off, and placed it in Bob's mouth as Prasad, as Alma's grace. Sometime during that night, he took his last breath, and she was with him. I was glad I was not there. I don't believe that I was meant to be there. As I say, this was all happening on God's timetable. On December the 21st, my sister and my son and I flew home to Memphis where he was to be buried, our hometown, and his body flew in on a later flight. A sleet storm had been predicted for Memphis. And since his service was to be one day before New Year's Eve, everything was hurried. We made the arrangements in a great hurry. And on December 23rd, that morning, as we were readying ourselves for the, for the service, uh, the weather reports became more and more ominous. As I recall, the service was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and only 30 people had made it in due to the holidays and the weather forecast. So, as the minister <clears throat> spoke about Bob and his life, and I bowed my head and closed my eyes for a prayer, I could hear the sleet pinging on the roof of the funeral home, and I knew that we were going to have to hurry through the, the graveside service. And sure enough, after the service, we were ushered into the limo and went to the gravesite. And they put heavy blankets over our laps because the sleep, it was cold. But as I looked out over the cemetery, it was a beautiful sight. The ground was covered in ice, and you could see red poinsettias on graves. And it was, it was grace itself in some strange fashion. And I told the minister, I said, you're going to have to hurry through the ceremony because it's, the sleep is really coming down hard now. And so it, w it was a hurried goodbye that we said to Bob. Well, we went back to the funeral home only to find that someone had broken into my sister's car and into his cousin's car and stole their purses. So instead of gathering at Bob's brother's house for a meal with family, we couldn't. Laurie said, I've got to go back to the hotel and cancel my credit cards. The storm kept getting worse, and we realized after she had canceled her cards that we couldn't get out of the, the parking lot. So there we were. The next day was Christmas Eve. Everybody but a few hearty souls had checked out of the Marriott Courtyard. And as we had breakfast that morning, I said to Mary, who had been serving us breakfast, I said, 
where can we eat tonight? Everything will be closed because it's Christmas Eve and the storm. And this black woman looked at me and she smiled and she said, I have to work uh, on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Yeah, I have to work Christmas Day. So she said, I'm going to spend the night here at the Marriott. And the Marriott has given all of us a honey-baked ham. And she said, I'm telling you, I'm going to bring your Christmas Eve dinner back here at 5 o'clock, and we're going to sit and have a meal together in the lobby. Now, while she was gone, my sister, my son, and my cousin, who that was a, the three people stranded with me at the Marriott, they walked to a 7-Eleven and a drugstore, and they did makeshift stockings. They bought liquor bags because they were the shape of a stocking, and they filled them with candy and little thoughtful articles. Like they gave me a pair of gloves that you could put lotion on your hands and then sleep in the gloves. So it, was, it was very entertaining to open these little stockings. And they found Mary a Santa hat and had her name spelled in glitter on it. So when we sat down for that Christmas Eve dinner, it was magical. Mary had her Santa hat on and we were gathered, the five of us around the table. There was an artificial Christmas tree in an artificial fireplace, fire in the fireplace. And it was just us. And we felt deeply blessed that Mary had come. Not only that, but it was across the street from uh, St. Francis Hospital. Bob's cousin's name was, that had her purse stolen, her name was Mary Frances. And during the course of this meal, I asked Mary what her middle name was. And of course, she said, it's Frances. It was that kind of angelic vibe that we all knew something was special was going on. I asked Mary about her family. I told her, I had told her that I lost a, a little girl who had been at St. Jude's and she said this to me, I have a son and he was a patient at St. Jude's, but he lived, he's 21 now. And later she showed us this picture. Now, what are the odds of all that happening. This was in God's time, Cairo's time. It was the most beautiful evening, and there was no hint of sorrow that night as we gathered and were held in the hands of grace. Christmas Day dawned, and we found that suddenly the airport was back open. We'd been there for three days and three nights, and that we were cleared to fly back to Atlanta. We got the last seats on the airplane. For my Christmas dinner, I had a package of cheese crackers from the vending machine at the motel. That was Christmas dinner, but it was enough. And the next day, the day before my sister drove home, we discovered that the tsunami, that great tsunami of 2004 had hit. And at that point, I knew that my old life was over and I've been living this new life for 11 and a half years now. And I love telling that story because it's so chock full of grace. Namaste.